and the lyrics there on that song feather we'll continue playing that song next time on friday but welcome everyone happy wednesday i hope you all enjoyed the martin luther king holiday and did some thinking about some of the things surrounding that holiday there and then also had a chance to recharge your batteries and refresh here even after just one week i think you know getting started things can be a little stressful and so nice to have a little bit of time off to set yourself up for success here our front row today last names p through s that means not a whole lot for us if you want to turn your video on that's awesome the more videos i get on the better here um, but, you know, other people that are not in that last names P through us, you can also turn your video on there um, as well. So it doesn't, you know, just that's kind of just to help me get to, you know, know some of you all a little bit more. And so now I'm focusing on a certain subset of people in the class that I focus on for asking questions and stuff like that. Um, so let's go ahead and let's start right off the bat here with a poll or our quiz. I'm going to launch polling here. And so, well, actually, let's work this together. You haven't had the homework done on this. Typically, as we get into the semester, you'll have homework due, like the homework will be due on the topic, and then you'll have a chance to do it in the quiz. This is the same quiz that's up on um, Canvas for the remote lecture quiz for today. So we're asked, uh, the result goes straight up along the y-axis. What is the angle formed where F and the 200-pound force meet tip to tail when using a parallelogram to solve this problem? So remember, what we were working on last time was if we have this line here, right? And there's our 200 pounds. And then we have this other line over here. This is our F right there. Well, they're all intersecting at the tail. And so our step number one was to do tip to tail. So let's take this 200 pound and let's draw it up here the same length. And actually, the same length, it looks like I need to draw a little bit shorter because it does tell us that the resultant goes straight up. So I'm going to stop right there along that y-axis because I know the resultant is going to go there. With the green line, then I'll do the same thing. Let me draw it parallel to that one right there. And it should get me to basically the same spot right there. I'm close enough uh, for my drawing right there. So that was step one to do tip to tail. Now what I'm asking for is what angle where F and the 200 pound force meet tip to tail. That could be either this one right here, or it could be this one over here. Either one of those is going to work. Our next step was to use corresponding angles. So we have this 45 degree angle here. Well, doesn't that mean that this angle over here then, that would be corresponding, that's a 45 degree angle. We have a 30 degree angle that's measured to the blue line from the horizontal. So let's go a 30 degree angle from, the blue line to the horizontal, that would be that angle right there. So 45 and 45. So that should give us the answer then. That's what we're looking for um, is the combination of those two, right? And I guess my 45, technically the 45 is from here to here and we are looking for the whole angle right there. So go ahead. Looks like I've got 39% um, of people have responded to the poll there. Um, let's go ahead and get those answers in. And I'm gonna go ahead and I've got 80% responded. Now I'm gonna go ahead and end polling and share those results. One thing about polling in Zoom is I believe you only have one opportunity to respond, right? So make sure when you're responding that you're, you're ready to go there. Um, so you can see D is the most popular choice, 75 degrees. And so that is the correct answer. And that's what we're going to be looking for up on Canvas for this problem here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing those results there. Any questions about this here? See a question in the chat here about missing class. If you have like an excused absence or something like that for the quiz, um, if you need an extension on the quiz because you're you have an excused absence or something like that, just let me know and I can extend that for you. And then in terms of seeing the quiz material, remember I post all the recordings of Canvas. So even if you miss class, you can still then go and watch those recordings 
And I usually get them up between 3 and 4 p.m. the same day. And so you can go and watch the recording and figure out the answer to the quiz and then also see all the lecture material as well. Okay, so there's our, our solution. Um, this is another example problem. Last time uh, we did example problem 2.1. I showed you example problem 2.2. This is another example problem from your textbook. So just reiterating some of the value there in that textbook. Moving on now to recitations. So I sent out an email yesterday. Recitations started yesterday. You can attend any recitation you like. Check the Canvas recitation Zoom links and schedule section of the statics homepage. It has more information, has the full list. Actually, Emma is doing a recitation on Sunday evening, which was really helpful last semester because you all a lot of times have homework due on Sunday evening. So when you're working on homework and you're like, oh man, I have a question. And you say, oh, let me go talk to Emma. She's doing a Zoom recitation on Sunday evening. So you go to any recitation, um, there's only, uh, you know, there's some recitations where you are, won't be able to do the hands-on activity. We'll talk more about that when we get there. But the main goal is high quality homework help, all right, for those recitations. Um, show up at any time. There are no lectures. So if you, you know, if the recitation starts at 3.30, but you show up at 4.15, totally fine, right? Um, only requirement is attending the, for the remote hands-on. And we'll announce when we start probably on Tuesday, January 26th. So, um, and you just have to show up to not lose about 1.5 towards your overall score. You need to do four remote hands-on activities over the semester. Um, and then each activity is available only during certain weeks. So like we'll have one, you know, we'll start one or two next week. And then we'll have those two will be all available before exam one. And then we'll have two more available before exam two. So they don't last the whole semester because they're related to the topics that are on that upcoming exam. And so they help you study as well. And then if you do more than four of the eight activities, so we'll have a total of eight, you'll get extra credit, about 1.5% extra credit towards your overall grade. So it's a significant amount if you do all eight of those hands-on activities. Um, I see a question there in the chat. What assignments are due on Sunday? Check the Canvas calendar. Typically we have mastering assignments due on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays. So like today's Wednesday. So the lecture we cover to the material we cover today, that'll be due on Sunday. And then Friday's lecture will be due on Tuesday. Monday's lecture will be due typically on Thursdays. Um, so yeah, the first week, of, uh, this week, it probably just looks like Thursday, like we had a Tuesday and a Thursday, and then Friday for the handwritten homework. And I think Ahmed is asking me all these questions too, because we talked last time about him reminding me to talk about the um, handwritten homework and all the homework assignments and stuff. So let me go, let me jump over to the Canvas calendar. So uh, everybody can see my Canvas page, right? Okay, so I'm gonna click on calendar over here. And if I open that up there, our typical week, so this is kind of not quite a typical week because of, um, um, the, oh, let me turn off my concrete design. I was like 5 p.m. We have something to do at 5 p.m. on Friday. Let me turn off my other class that I teach there. Okay, so there we go. So typically we're gonna have our mastering. So like mastering is vector operations. That's a mastering assignment. That's an online thing. Number two, that's an online thing. That's mastering. Number three, that's an online thing. Number four, that's an online thing. So that's a Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday for mastering stuff. The Friday, and it's, it can change, but typically we'll have the handwritten homework due on Friday. That handwritten homework, what it's asking you to do is you're gonna turn in all your work for mastering assignments, number one. And I put in parentheses right next to it, like what mastering assignments you're gonna do. So basically what I recommend you do is that when you start working on your mastering, you go in and you start writing it out in this format. And the format is given find solution, which is how we are solving all of our problems. So it's gonna look something like this. So you're gonna have given information, the headers across the top there, what you're asked to find and then solution. And then everything is vertically stacked. And you should have gone through a lot of this in the getting started quiz and all the information that you can see, um, it's all up there, up on Canvas there. Okay, so any, mastering assignment. And so if I go back here to this one, so let's 
we're going to do Cartesian vectors today. And, and so let me, I'll show you the homework problems for Cartesian vectors. Um, but first, before we show you the homework problems, our learning objectives, what we need to be able to do, right? These learning objectives are super important. The right-handed coordinate system for all possible orientations. So we'll talk about that. Formulate a unit vector, a position vector, a force vector, given coordinates, direction, cosines, and planar projections. Remember, these are all exam questions. So this could be, I could turn this into an exam question by giving you a picture and saying, okay, find the, you know, the force vector for this picture right here. We also need to be able to calculate the magnitude of a vector. And then if we're doing a, this last learning objective, this is really about having a solid understanding of all the, the relationships between the unit vector, position vector, and force vector. And if we can do that, then we have a really good understanding of those things. Okay, so our, our homework problems. So let's talk about for the, you know, this is a mastering problem. This is an online problem and you enter a number, right? And it's gonna tell you whether it's wrong or right. You have six tries and you lose 3% each try. And so this is part, this is the majority of your homework grade. This is like 85% of your homework grade is to get these numbers right on mastering engineering. The handwritten homework is really just so that you get in the habit of writing out your given information, writing out what you're asked to find and writing out your solution. It's gonna help you understand the material better. It's gonna help your problem solving skills. It's gonna help you troubleshoot when mastering says incorrect. No, that is the wrong answer. It's gonna help you when you go to the TAs. It's gonna help you when you come to my office hours, which are today from three to 4.30. Um, right, it's gonna like, so there's lots of different reasons we're doing that, but every problem you do on mastering, you're gonna do that in the handwritten homework. What I would recommend that you do is you look at this mastering problem, what I would write down is given. I would write down all my given information. That's never gonna change, right? And then write down what you're asked to find. That's never going to change. Your solution, if you start working something and you're like, oh, F is, you know, this thing and, oh, wait, actually, um, I don't need that quite yet. And then, oh, maybe, you know what, I need this next. And, oh, and then I need this next. And, you know, maybe you do something wrong. Don't be afraid to cross stuff out on that handwritten homework. We're not going to take off points for that. Look at the rubric for it. It's very clear and specific. Also, we will focus on feedback for the first two handwritten homework assignments. So, you know, if you're looking, you're not quite sure if it's like, if this is okay, submit it and the graders will let you know, but you'll still get 100% credit as long as it looks like you are trying there. If you have multiple parts in a problem, it doesn't matter how you break it up. You could write given for part A and then find for part A and then solution for part A. You could write under given, you could write part A, part B, and then under find part A, part B, and then under solution part A and B. So you, you can write given find solution twice for part A and B, or you can just write it once and put part A and B in there. However you wanna do it, if it doesn't say it in the rubric that it's wrong, then it's, it's going to be okay. Okay, any questions? That was kind of a lot there, but hopefully I think you've seen it before. Um, but remember, we also don't wanna make this a, you know, have you take a lot of extra time. And if you just write given, if you write find, and then as you're working through the solution, then you cross stuff out. You know, I recommend not erasing anything. How many times have you erased something and then realized five minutes later, oh, that was right. So, you know, cross it out or maybe, you know, put a question mark by it. You can also write off to the side, maybe as you're, you can start studying for the exams. Step one, I did this. Step two, I did this. Oh, this was a key equation take notes on there, it's totally fine. It doesn't have to look like this totally pristine thing as long as you follow like the vertical stacking and stuff like that in the rubric. Okay, not seeing any questions pop up in the chat. I'll pause though for a second. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, so for like this homework problem, write down the given information. Um, in this one, you're asked to find the magnitude of the resultant force and the direction cosines of the resultant force. We'll talk about that today for those two different given formats for vectors. This one asks to find the magnitude of the resultant force for the two forces acting at A 
and also find something called the coordinate direction angles. Okay, so our first learning objective is a right-handed coordinate system. And for us, really, the main thing, and I have my little right-handed coordinate system here. Remember, you can control how much of my screen share you see and how much of the video you see. So you can zoom in on the video. I won't do a lot of stuff off the video. But my right-handed coordinate system here, basically, it just means that it fixes the relative locations of X, Y, and Z. And we can use our right hand to figure out where everything falls in there. For us in statics, what we need to pay attention to is do they give it to us like this? Do they give it to us like this? We're going to see different instances, different you know, orientations of that right-handed coordinate system. But the idea is that the relative locations of X, Y, and Z are all in the same location. OK, so let's go in. And we're going to talk about now there's three different ways that we can find a force vector. And I'm going to write all this down, but I've just got that kind of image up there for us to start thinking about this. And so for today's lecture here, let's start by writing down our topic. And we're doing Cartesian vectors. And the, you know, the main thing with Cartesian vectors, as compared to the last thing we did, which was parallelograms, is, you know, the, the main motivation here is that if we break things, Cartesian means X, Y, and Z. If we break things into X, Y, and Z, then we can find the resultant by just adding them together. We just add the X components, add the Y components, add the Z components. It's really easy once we can get them as X, Y, and Z. As compared to like all the triangles and the corresponding angles and the law of sines and the law of cosines, right? So a lot easier than doing that. Also, we can't really, I mean, we could, but it'd be really hard to do those triangles in three dimensions. So we move into three dimensions when we break things into X, Y, and Z components here. So let's first start in 2D. So let's take a look in 2D because there's some really cool stuff that goes from two dimensions into three dimensions. And if we have a y-axis that's going straight up and we have an x-axis that's going out to the right there, and let's say I've got a force vector. And I've got this force vector here, and it's got a magnitude, let's say it's got 100 pounds. And maybe I've got a strap. And we'll talk about this strap, but I've got, you know, that 100 pounds is in this orange strap right here. And then we have an angle and we're given, and I'm going to actually, to for us to, to associate this in the 3D, I'm going to call the angle from the x-axis alpha. And also, and this is going to be the same as we call, we call it in three dimensions. I'm going to, from the y-axis, I'm going to call that beta. And it's redundant to have an alpha and a beta, right? Because we know that alpha plus beta would be equal to 90 degrees. But what we're doing in two dimensions is we're going to find, if we want to take this into a vector, we can find the projection along the x-axis, and that would be fx. And then if we're using Let's use alpha. Wouldn't fx be equal to what? In terms of the 100, is it the cosine of alpha or is it the sine of alpha? Um, Enzo, Swartz, what do you think? Cosine or sine of alpha? Cosine. It's cosine, right? Because it's the adjacent side of that. And it's the only reason it's cosine of alpha is because remember that cosine of alpha is equal to the adjacent over the hypotenuse, right? So that's all we're doing right there. Fx is 100 cosine alpha. Now, what if I wanted to do this in terms of um, the, the y component? So I find the projection of that force vector onto the y-axis, Fy, and that's going to be the magnitude times in terms of beta, that would also be the cosine. So I'm using alpha for the x and beta for the y. If we're in two dimensions, we don't have to do that, but this is going to translate into three dimensions. 
And so now that we have that, now I can say, oh, my force vector is fxi plus fyj. And there's lots of different ways to write the i and the j. You can do it with a hat. You can do this with the carrots on each side, um, with the brackets on each side. Any way you want to write the force vector is fine for your homework. It doesn't really matter, and for exams as well. And so our f then, at this point, if we plug those in, we end up with a 100 cosine alpha i plus a 100 cosine beta j. And if we look at that, we can pull out the um, we can pull out the magnitude, right? The magnitude is is the same in both of those terms. So really, our f is going to be equal to a 100 times cosine alpha i plus cosine of beta j. And this right here, this is actually the unit vector. So the unit vector u is equal to cosine alpha i plus a cosine of beta j. The unit vector has a magnitude equal to what? Anyone? What's the magnitude of the unit vector? Magnitude of one. It should be one, right? Oh, and I see another question in the chat. Should it be sine of beta? Um, no, because for beta, isn't the adjacent, the same reason over here that, right, cosine beta is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. Well, the adjacent side is the Fy. Now, if we were using alpha, it would be sine of alpha, right? For Fy, we could also say 100 times sine of alpha, but not times the sine of beta. And remember, like I said before, that those alpha and beta are redundant, but it's gonna translate for us into three dimensions. Okay, so it's a unit vector. The other thing um, I also like to think about is it's a unitless vector. And, the you know the cool thing about that is that means if we take that unit vector and multiply it times a magnitude, then what are the units that we get out of that? So like back here up at this equation that I'm highlighting right there, we have a hundred pounds, right? This is in units of pounds times a unit list vector. Well, that means my force vector is still going to be in pounds. Okay, so. Um, also, we can, isn't, can we also say the unit vector, we could also do this if we had the force vector to start with, wouldn't it be fx plus fy in the j? And what do we need to divide that by to get it into a unit vector? If we do this in terms of not alpha and beta, but in terms of fx and f, like say we knew fx and fy already, then what would we divide that by to make it a magnitude of one and to make it unitless. Wouldn't that be um, just divide it by the magnitude? Right, because doesn't that make it unitless? Because we're dividing forces by forces and it's also making the magnitude of that whole thing equal to one. Um, and so, and remember also, Right, that isn't, if we take fx over f, isn't that equal to cosine of alpha, which is the x component of the unit vector, isn't it, right? So, so this is all coming back. The main idea here is that this is all coming back to the fact that cosine is the adjacent over the hypotenuse, right? That's what this whole thing is established based off of that idea there. Okay, so let's go into 3D now. Okay, now in 3D, we've established our basis. Let's draw now, I'm still gonna put, let me put the Y axis still straight up. Let me put the X axis off to the right. And now my Z axis is 
technically it's coming straight out of the board, right? My, I mean, my z-axis is really going straight into the camera, right? That's that, the there's the z-axis, right? It's going straight in. But when we're drawing a three-dimensional thing on a 2D sheet of paper, we end up angling, oops, I put x, that should be z down here, right? Um, we should be, you know, we angle it off to the side so it looks three-dimensional right there. Now let's take um, and let's get a force vector. And so now we're going to have this force vector. I'm going to still make it in general, it goes up into the right there. And so let's say we now have a different magnitude. How about we have 200 pounds on this, um, on this force vector right there. Now, right now, does it, does it look three-dimensional? It doesn't look three-dimensional, does it? This is really cool. What we can do if we draw lines parallel to our axes, so if I go and I draw a line parallel to the y-axis and I show that, oh, you know what? This is actually right here. And I say, you know what? From the tip of that force vector actually ends up intersecting somewhere in the xz plane. And I can then draw a line parallel to the x-axis right there and a line parallel to the z-axis right there. Now, we can kind of get this sense that it's coming out of the page there. And actually, I've got the real thing here. I've got a demo. I'm going to move my camera. See, there's the, you can kind of see it right there, right? There's the X, Y, and the Z axis. And I've got a strap, and it's attached up there. So that's what we're, we're dealing with, right? There's our, our real world scenario there for the X, Y, and the Z. Now, we talked about alpha and beta before. Well, alpha in three dimension is still going to be from the X axis. From the Y axis, it's going to be beta. And from the Z axis, it's going to be gamma. And as it's really hard to show on a piece of paper here, but we're gonna end up with basically the same thing. Our F is going to be 200 times the cosine of alpha in the I. So the magnitude times cosine alpha still, just like we saw in 2D. The magnitude times cosine of beta in the J plus the magnitude times the cosine of gamma in the K direction. And I've got a little video here that I want to show of a um, of a physical model, and this will help us see why it's still cosine alpha, cosine beta, cosine of gamma. Now, because you can see the equation that we're working with there in the background. Today, I have a three-dimensional Cartesian coordinate system to demonstrate the right triangles for alpha, beta, and gamma. Alpha, beta, and gamma are the coordinate direction angles that describe the three-dimensional direction of a vector relative to the positive x, y, and z axes. In this example here, I've got the positive x-axis going off to my left, the positive y-axis is going straight up, and the positive z-axis is going straight out. The force vector is here, and its line of action is here, and it's such that it's in the positive x, y, and z direction for this example, just like I have written on the board behind me. The, we will notice two main things for each of these right triangles. One, each of the right triangles are in their own plane, and two, the right angles always touch the corresponding axes. So let's take a look at alpha. Alpha is measured from the positive x-axis to the line of action of the force. The 90 degree angle is here, and it's in its own plane. Beta is measured from the positive y-axis to the line of action, the 90 degree angle is here. Gamma is measured from the positive z-axis 
to the line of action, the 90 degree angle. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and, and stop it right there and we can finish that discussion on paper now. So this is, this is why, because they're all right triangles, this is why we can still use the magnitude times cosine alpha, the magnitude times cosine beta, and the magnitude times the cosine of gamma, because they're all these their own right triangles um, in that sense. And then also we can pull out the 200, right? They all have the magnitude in them. And so we end up with cosine alpha I plus a cosine beta J plus a cosine of gamma K. And so again, this is the unit vector. Has the same properties that we discussed before where that unit vector is, um, right, the, that's the, the unit vector is cosine alpha, cosine beta plus cosine of gamma, we can also write the unit vector in terms of fxi plus fyj plus fzk hat divided again by just the magnitude of the force right there. So we can find the unit vector and, you know, by doing that also, we know that cosine of alpha is equal to the adjacent fx over the hypotenuse. Cosine of beta is equal to fy, the adjacent over the hypotenuse, which is f. These all, all these right triangles have the same hypotenuse, don't they? fz over f. And so depending on what we're asked to do, sometimes we're asked to find the alpha, beta, and gamma. Those are the what we call the direction cosines. So alpha, beta, and gamma are the direction cosines. And so when we're asked to find the direction cosines, then we can use those last equations that we wrote down. If we're given alpha, beta, gamma, we can use that to find the force vector by use, taking the cosine of each of those angles. Our main overarching equation though, our really important equation is that our force vector is going to be equal to the magnitude times the unit vector, right? Isn't that what this equation is right here? That is the, for, the magnitude times the unit vector. So this is a really key equation for us. And so it's just a matter of how we can find that unit vector there. Okay, any questions about this so far? So that's one of the ways that that we that I put on the slides that's in our learning objective. It's one of the ways that we can find a force vector. It's when we're given alpha, beta, gamma. Okay, another way, the second thing that we need to be able to do is we need to do it with position vectors. This would be if we were given and you have a homework problem where they basically give you the coordinates of where a rope sits. And so for us, let's just jump right into an example. And actually this is the, this is the example I wanna do for what I've set up over here. And so I've got the, the, this strap goes at the origin there and we're doing to draw a picture of this. We have the strap that goes from the origin of the coordinate system right there. And it's just attached to a hook on my ceiling right there. And let's say we've got like 200 pounds on there. Well, in this case, maybe we don't know alpha, beta, gamma but we know where the origin is located and we know the coordinates of this point up here. So let's say we know the coordinates of those two points. Well, how do we then define that as a force vector? So for position vectors, let's draw our picture here. And so we're gonna have, I'm gonna stick with the y-axis going up, but remember we can see different orientations on the homework. And so pay attention to whatever that orientation is. 
So we have X, Y, and Z. We've got a strap. I'm gonna do, the, the strap is orange. Oh, you know what? I do have, I have orange. Let's do orange for our orange strap. And so let's call this point right here, point A. And that's at the, on my whiteboard here. And that's just at coordinate zero, zero, and zero. And then up here somewhere, I've got point B and this is my ceiling. And let's say this is coordinates of two feet, three feet and four feet. So our coordinates right there are two, three, and four. We can say, oh, you know what? This strap, maybe it has a tension equal to 200 pounds. So which would be like the magnitude would be 200 pounds in that right there. Now, again, let's make this look three dimensional. So I'm gonna draw a dash line down to somewhere about right there. It's parallel to the Y, another dash line that's parallel to the X and another dash line that's parallel to the Z right there. Wouldn't each of those da dash lines really be representative of like the distance between A and B? Like this one right here would be the distance um, would be equal to the X, right? Wouldn't that be two feet? Cause it's parallel to the X. Wouldn't that distance right there, if it's parallel to the Z, that would be the distance from A to B in the Z direction. So that would be four. And then this distance right here would be equal to the Y distance, which is three. So those dashed lines, not only are they showing us where that falls and making it look three-dimensional, but they're also giving us the distances too that we go from A to B. So what we wanna do is we want to find the force vector. Let's find the force vector from A to B. And I guess I don't need to put the, the in there. How about we just say find F A to B? B. Now our, our main equation is still going to be, when we're doing position vectors, it's the magnitude of A to B times the unit vector from A to B. Last time we found the unit vector using cosines of alpha, betas, and gammas, right? So we can find the unit vector with alpha, betas, and gammas, if we're given that, we're not given alpha, beta, and gamma in this case. So we can use, though, the position vector to find the unit vector. Our unit vector from A to B is going to be based off of the position vector divided by the magnitude of that position vector. So just like we did with force vectors, right? It's the vector divided by the magnitude. We can always do that to find any kind of vector. We can do that. We can take any vector, divide it by its magnitude, and we can find the unit vector. And then once we have the unit vector, all we have to do is multiply it by 200. Right down here in this equation, we have a scalar times a vector, multiply 200 times the unit vector, and so our unit vector is going to be now, oh, actually, how do we find a position vector? A position vector, mathematically, we can always do as final minus initial. So XB minus XA in the I, plus a YB minus YA in the J direction, plus a ZB minus ZA in the K direction. So mathematically, we can always use this. Okay, so this one always works. Now, I also like to think about a um, position vector as like directions. So it tells us how to get from A to B. And it, it just tells us like in terms of X, Y, and Z. So if you were standing at A, how far would you go in the x direction? Wouldn't you just need to go two feet? So it's a two i. Now, 
how far would you need to go in the y direction? Well, you need to go three feet. And then how far would you need to go in the z direction? You need to go four feet. And so really because a is zero, 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 right? It's just technically in this one, it's just the coordinates of point B turns into our position vector. And then we can find the unit vector now is going to be equal to a 2i plus a 3j plus a 4k. And, and remember, if you want to write this in brackets with commas, it's faster. That's totally fine. A lot of times, just so we're totally clear, in lectures, I'll just write it out for us. And then the magnitude, how do we find the magnitude of vector? We just take the square root of the components, right? So two squared plus a three squared plus a four squared. And so we're gonna find here our unit vector when we plug that in is gonna be 0 0.37i. I like to do things in decimal format and usually about two decimals is plenty for us in static 0 0.56 in the J and a plus 0 0.74 in the K direction. So there's our, there's our unit vector that we have. I'm, I'm gonna pause for a second. Well, not pause for a second, but I wanna do a math check. Um, I guess it is kind of pausing from continuing on with the problem just to make sure I didn't make any math errors up here. And I know the magnitude is gonna equal one. So can I take 0.37 squared plus a 0 0.56 squared plus a 0 0.74 squared, take the square root of that, and it should come out to being really, really close to 1.0, okay? It might be 0.9999, might be 1.0001 or something like that, but it's gonna be really close to zero. And when you're doing your homework, um, you know, one little error and all of a sudden you're like, you know, nothing in the problem is correct. So it's little checks like that can be really helpful as we're um, moving along here. Okay, any questions? Okay, now that we've checked our unit vector, we can find our force vector from A to B. It's going to be a 200 times the unit vector, which is going to be a 0.37i plus a 0.56j plus a 0.74k hat. Oh, you know, I'm dealing with all positives, aren't I? Um, do I have to worry about negative and positives with position vectors? No, it'll give me a negative if it's going in the negative direction. It'll give me a positive if it's going in the positive direction. Same with alpha, beta, and gamma. If alpha, beta, and gamma are greater than 90 degrees, they're going to give us a negative number. So it'll do all that math for us when we're um, these alpha, beta, and gamma or the position vectors. So now my I can find the Overall vector here, I will do it. I'll, have it. I'll do this one with brackets so everybody knows what I'm talking about. So 74 and a 112 and a 148. Now, think about logically, what is that really telling us? The units are in pounds. It's telling us that if I have right there on the board, and I've got 200 pounds on this, it's telling me how much force is acting in each direction. So I had this thing just taped up there, right? I just had the end of this thing was just taped up there. But it's telling me there's 74 pounds trying to pull that in the X direction. There's 112 pounds trying to pull that in the Y direction. And there's 148 pounds trying to pull that in the Z direction. And so it actually means something, right? It's not just like, oh, we got the right answer. We have these numbers here. No, it's actually telling us how many pounds are trying to rip that tape off of that wall in each of the directions. Let's also, um, let's find the coordinate direction angles. Let's find alpha, beta, gamma for this. And so how could we do that? 
What do we know? Cosine of alpha would be equal to what? The 0 0.37. 0 0.37. Yes, absolutely. Right. Um, because isn't that 0.37 is the that term in the unit vector. Isn't this, couldn't we also, did anybody else think about it's equal to 74 divided by 200? Isn't that the same thing? If you take 74 and divide it by 200, don't you get point, you actually end up with 0.37, right? So, you know, this is Fx divided by the F right there. So either one of those, but yeah, the, the 0.37, it's, it's already there, isn't it? So our alpha in this case, um, Oh, I guess I didn't do the, the calculation. I'll just write them down though. And then cosine of beta we could find would be zero. We just set it equal to 0 0.56. Um, so it, we just take the inverse cosine, right? Of, of each of these. Um, and then cosine of gamma would be equal to our 0 0.74. And so now we've seen both ways, right? We've seen given um, alpha, beta, and gamma, find a force vector. Now we've seen, given a force vector, find alpha, beta, and gamma. And then I see Kolob is asking, so if any of those exceeded the F vector, the system will fail. Yeah. And so a lot of times our strength, my tape doesn't really have, it has, you know, some strength along the board. It has some strength pulling off the board. Um, and so, yeah, basically I, I could, my strength of the tape, I would probably think about in terms of X, Y, and Z components. And so I compare and say, if one of the components fails, then the whole thing fails, absolutely. Okay. All right, so we, we have one more type. There's three ways to find a force vector, direction cosines, position vectors, and planar projections. Okay, um, if we go back up to our learning objectives here, draw a right handed coordinate. We did that one formulate a unit vector, position vector, and force vector given coordinates, direction cosines, planar projections. Okay, so the, the, the planar projections that's the one more we have to do. And what I did for that was I have up here a nice document. If you go into my lecture recordings. So right here in the lectures and office hours, here's where you get to the lectures link. Um, here's where you get to my office hours link. Under lecture recordings, I've already posted this planar projection lecture example notes. And I, I made this on my iPad over break because I find this can be one of the, the more challenging ones to, to look at here. And, and so I've, already, I've created notes for you and the steps to follow. And, and so, well, I'll just go over this kind of briefly here, but use this as, as a tool. And so what we're doing with planar projections, F2 in this picture is a planar projection. All the angles do not go to the line of action. This one over here is alpha, beta, and gamma because they go to the line of action. However, this 45 degrees, notice it's measured from the negative X axis, that's not, Correct. Okay. So we would use that that one in, in our class here. It needs to always go from the positive axis. So it actually technically be 135, not 45. But that's not what we're talking about here. Step one, drawing the original info. So to take this F2 and let's draw it. The key is to ID when drawing which lines are parallel, just like we did earlier today. So this line, blue line, is parallel to the z-axis. So I'm going to make sure when I draw it, it looks parallel to the z. This line is parallel to the y-axis. Step two then, knowing which lines are parallel is gonna help us identify where the right angles are. There's a right angle here. There's a right angle here. And I talk about why that happens. And so we can follow all these same steps. These are posted. Yes, Kristen, they are underneath where you find the lecture recordings up on Canvas. So, the, and then I talk about the pink line. So then once we identify the right angles, now all we're doing is right triangle geometry. We have opposite sides, we have adjacent sides. And so I, I focus first on this right triangle up here, 
And then I focus on this right triangle here, formulate the vector, and then we can follow the same approach for any planar projection problem. Take a look at that when you're working through the homework and then identifying which lines are parallel or which axis is super key. And they are posted if I, if I shut this, make that smaller, they're under my lecture recordings. So I got you know lecture recordings for today's lecture, but I've got the example notes are right there. And then I'll also post the lecture recording here as well. You all have a great rest of your Wednesday. We'll see you on Friday. We're gonna move on, do some more vector stuff with the dot products. Remember I have office hours, go to recitations if you need help, start that homework early. Thank you all and have a great Thank day. You.